Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted uh, to welcome our keynote speaker. Liz Bonin, the renowned wildlife biologist and biochemist, has played a huge role in raising public awareness of environmental issues through her many programs in particular, including ones about Galapagos, Big Blue Live, and most recently, um, only last month, through her uh, harrowing documentary, Drowning in Plastic. Liz, come and join me. I was looking at uh, how of uh, drowning in plastic was being reported. And the Daily Express uh, website, which, as you know, has, I think it's fair to say, probably an older readership profile who might be a bit sceptical about you know, some of the, 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 the warnings about environmental things, ran a clip of the baby birds being made to throw, you know, vomit up the pieces of plastic. And I think the headline was how Liz Bonin's film will make you cry and horrify you. And I thought it was really interesting, the level of public engagement you got straight away, you got to the heart of the point you're trying to make? We certainly didn't set out to sensationalise anything or make anyone cry, but we did set out to um, make a documentary that didn't hold any punches and to really just not shy away from the reality of what um, is going on in our oceans. And I completely underestimated the scale of the problem. I knew what I was going to film. I knew about the birds. I knew about the coral reefs. I knew about the Arctic. But when you see it with your own eyes at a scale that is really quite um, harrowing and sobering, um, we just decided to put it all out there just as I was seeing it, in a more of a sort of obs dox style, if you will, than so, a classic science documentary. Yeah. So take me back to just take me through the time scale of when you were filming, where you went, and kind of what your methodology was. Well, we started off just trying to, right, we're going to get a scale of how bad it is in the oceans. Um, then we're going to trace it back. Where is it all coming from? Who are the biggest contributors to the ocean problem? And who are, who's doing anything to try and stop it? And where ultimately that would take us? But we also followed different trails as we were in Indonesia, for example. We sort of went with what was developing as we were there, really. We started off on Lord Howe Island with these shearwaters, flesh-footed shearwaters, who um, ingest more plastic relative to their, to their weight than any other marine animal. And when you see these chicks emerging for the first time from their burrows after three months of being inadvertently fed to death by their parents, uh, with uh, this lavage procedure that expelled, on average, 40 to 50 pieces per three-month-old chick. That's amazing. Um, and then when you find out that of the birds the scientists can't, can't grab the nights they emerge, the next morning they do sweeps on the beaches and find all of these dead birds. The chicks are trying to take off over the surf, embark on their migration, their first migration of their lives, and they have no energy because their stomachs are full of plastic. Sometimes they find as much as 280 pieces of plastic in a, in a chick, and that is equivalent to a human having 10 kilograms of plastic in, in, our, in our stomachs. We started off with something quite difficult to film and it sort of just kept on going from there. It was, it was a difficult project to work on. Um, we also went to the Arctic to find out how scientists there are, are trying to research just how much microplastics have infiltrated the food web there. Um, microplastics form from the, the UV action of plastics floating in the oceans. The big pieces start getting very brittle, the UV light makes it brittle, then they break up with the mechanical action of waves on the shore. But also in the Arctic, because it's so incredibly cold, as the ice freezes and thaws, it sort of sucks up loads of plastic, crunches it up in the ice, and then dumps it in one go every season. Amy Lusher, the scientist we filmed with, said to me that it's an estimated 180 six billion billion microparticles are dumped in one go in the Arctic. Scientists once thought that the, the poles were the only places left on the planet that were immune to plastics. That is certainly no longer true. And when it comes to where it is in the food web, mm. well, it seems it's everywhere. It's from the zooplankton at the, at the base of the web, the very basis of uh, ecosystems. Um, and it moves from, it, for example, from zooplankton to filter feeding mussels to the walruses that burrow in the sand, feeding on the mussels, uh, or zooplankton to fish, to seals, to polar bears, or to humans. Um, so that's, I know there was new research published this morning in The Guardian confirming that. You know, they were finding it in periwinkles at, at every scale. You also found that uh, there's more to it than just the fragments themselves. What is it that they carry? Plastics uh, are made with 
toxic chemicals, um, everything from phthalates to uh, BPA to all sorts of chemicals that give plastics their malleability, their properties. Um, but they are known to be toxic, not just to animals, but also to humans. They are endocrine disruptors, so they affect your, an animal's hormones, which means reproduction is affected, growth is affected. They are also related to hormone-mediated cancers. Um, and we're only just beginning to understand now that microplastics are in the food web. Recent research has shown that microplastics are in humans' tools as well. So it's, it's prevalent across you know, the planet and all living systems. So the repercussions of that, yeah. we're only beginning to understand what that might be doing to the food web, and yet for decades, animals in all different sorts of marine ecosystems have been ingesting microplastics. Not only that, but we now know that nanoplastics, even smaller particles, delivering these toxic loads of chemicals that not only are made, not only are found in plastics, but plastics are also known to absorb heavy metals and persistent organic pollutants from the environment and they are able to leach that, leach those chemicals into uh, animals. Um, nanoplastics are able to cross cell membranes, cell boundaries. So that's a game changer when it comes to how much we might be ingesting, yeah. but also how much we're inhaling in the air. Apparently we are ingesting more microplastics and nanoplastics through the air we breathe than through the seafood we might be eating. And all of this is just, it's very new research, it's emerging and it paints a pretty grim, pic grim picture of what is going on when it comes to plastics affecting not only the health of, of marine animals, but our health as well. So let's break down some of the issues you've raised there. Apart from the high-profile documentaries by you and people like David Attenborough, there have been media reports, I would say only in the last couple of years, suddenly about paradise beaches awash with plastic. I think back, maybe it's as much as four years when, you know, this idea of that place in the Pacific Ocean where you had that sea of plastic. The garbage patch. The garbage yeah. patch. Um, so they only appear to have impacted public awareness relatively recently. And given the scale of pollution, can you give any insight into why? Why we're only finding Why out the scale. Why we only seem to have woken up to it you know, once it's already <laughs> everywhere. That's a really, really good question. And it's, the quest it's probably the one question I kept on asking every different scientist the more I was discovering about the scale of the problem. And the answer isn't simple. And scientists, you know, you've got, they, they're, they're almost apologetic to me saying to me, look, we just didn't have the funding. And the funding has to be justified. And it's only now that the human health issue that's becoming apparent that we're getting more funding because for some reason we still don't understand that the health of the oceans impacts our health. And so there wasn't enough focus on it. It's, it's kind of as simple and as harrowing as that. Given where we are now, um, are there obvious solutions? There are obvious solutions. When we focused on the, the 10 um, biggest plastic polluting rivers in the world that happened to be in Southeast Asia. Um, as a result of that part of our film, a lot of people commented on, well, it's Southeast Asia's problem. They're not given any support with regards to waste management, um, but also global brands are selling them all of these sachets that aren't recyclable or they're not collected. And we should say these individual sachets Individ rather than oh big bottles God, like because they can't afford necessarily. So these, these rivers, bottles. we went to the Chitterim in Indonesia. It's, it's these rafts a, a mile long every day are floating down this river heading towards the sea. Sachets are, when you trace it back, you go to the markets in Indonesia mm -hmm. and it's just sachets everywhere. It's obscene. But is there a responsibility there, not only from local governments not providing villagers any waste management facilities, they, they're resorting to having to dump their plastic on the riverbanks. They've got nowhere else to put it. Mm -hmm. But also the brands that, that supply these products to countries they know full well are, are, are not able to dispose of them properly, mm -hmm. that's a huge issue. And so it's easy to go right. The big problem is developing countries, it's not us. But actually, when you break it down to the fact that we recycle globally, everywhere, developing countries, developed countries, 11% of our plastic, that's all we recycle. In the UK, it's as low as nine, possibly as low as 3%. We, of, the, of the plastic that we collect, we collect something like 2.75 million tonnes of plastic packaging every year here in the UK. About half of it is incinerated. Half of our, this recycling is incinerated or put into landfill. The rest, a small percentage, is recycled or actually downcycled. That's a whole other issue. We don't, a bottle doesn't become another bottle. No. A bottle becomes plastic um, carpet backing. Therefore, new virgin plastic still has to be used to make new bottles. 
but the rest of it is shipped. And where is it shipped, exported? To Indonesia, a country with an 81% waste mismanagement rate. More so now to Malaysia, that has an 86% waste mismanagement rate. And there was a, a, a big expose on uh, plastic recycling bags from the UK, from Germany, from Spain, from Japan, from Australia, sitting on these illegal dump sites in Malaysia, doing nothing but being wafted into rivers, yeah. into the ocean. So how, how big is this problem? Whose responsibility is this? It's a global issue that we, we are all responsible for. When it comes to solutions, mm -hmm. of, you know, what is, has been a very overwhelming experience for me, we have the solutions. They are clear, they are there for the taking. What I'm learning is global world leaders and the plastics industry are not doing enough. There's talk of um, incremental change, phasing out some plastics, making certain products recyclable by 2025. The ocean doesn't have that long. Um, and for me, it's pretty clear. For me, it's make less virgin plastic, period. Ban single-use plastics like Costa Rica is aiming to do by 2021. Just ban it. Yeah. Don't tax the recent budget announced, okay, there'll be a tax on any plastic product that has less than 30% recycled material in it. That doesn't really mean anything to me, and forgive me if I'm naive, but ultimately that means that 60% can still be virgin plastic. Um, so we need to really tackle making less of the stuff. And then, considering what we've discovered about the UK's recycling myth, we need to take responsibility for our own plastic in every country, and the plastics industry must be taxed at source to take responsibility for this indestructible material that it makes. So therefore, it pays for the correct collection and the correct reuse of this plastic so we have a fully circular economy, and there's none, no more of this virgin plastic being, you know, used. Is there too much emphasis on the public responsibility? Yes, I think there is. I think the UK has been extraordinary in, in its reaction to this and in, in really trying to change its individual behaviours, not using straws anymore, taking their you know, reusable cups with them, um, and litter, you know, anti-litter campaigns on the beaches. They're all laudable um, efforts, but they're not going to solve this crisis. If plastic keeps being made at an incredibly overwhelming rate, by the way, in the US alone, plastics factories, i.e. the fossil fuel industry, because 99% of the raw materials for plastics comes from the fossil fuel industry, uh, $180 billion are being invested in the next 10 years to increase production of the same plastic by 40%. So cleaning up the mess as it gets washed up on the beach, to me, is not going to crack this. Giving up straws is not going to crack this. Scandinavia, Finland. Well, let's talk. Yeah, I wanted to ask about how far national attitudes um, are different. Yeah, there are. I, mean, I think the UK is, is actually, with regards to the public behaviours, um, are pretty, pretty impressive compared to many other countries in Europe. But then Finland and other Scandinavian countries are really leading by example, and that's because they're tackling it from all angles. The public are being reactive, but also the government have instigated um, a deposit return scheme for the bottles, PET bottles, that can actually be recycled into bottles again about 25 times. And the incentive there is actually the public get rewarded for returning their bot bottles, and the plastics industry has to fund that system. That, to me, is an absolutely brilliant solution. But they're also looking, they're world leaders in biomaterials, alternative materials that need to be composted, but they're working not only at making these new products, but at, but, but at developing the infrastructure that can compost the products properly. And what properly. sort of materials? These things like bamboo fibres? Uh, bamboo, wood, uh, sugar cane, seaweed, um, and also bioplastics that are made from the petroleum industry, but that are, if composted correctly, can be returned to the ground. So there's, there's a lot of research being done in countries like this, and there are a lot of experts I'm speaking to in the UK that are really trying very hard to make the UK a centre of excellence for that technology. And I think that is a promising area, but it needs to be implemented properly. We don't have um, enough or fully functioning, efficient composting facilities here yet. A lot of the materials need to be industrially composted, so that needs... Funding. Investment, yeah. Investment, yes. And um, what's your view on, given the challenge of the state we're in, um, in terms of political leadership and will, priorities, 
you know, what's your view on how much realistically can be done along the lines Look, that you'd like to see? I speak as an individual here um, and as a consumer. I am scratching my head as to what else needs to happen for political will that matches the scale of this crisis. We know how much it's damaging our oceans. We need to keep communicating how important that is for, for the future of our planet, for our future as a species. We now know that it's affecting us potentially in incredibly um, dramatic ways when it comes to our own health, and yet, so far globally, aside from Costa Rica, a few countries that are just forging ahead, really, so far globally, politically speaking and industry speaking, we are still discussing incremental changes and, and tokenism and, and empty promises. And as an individual and as a consumer, I am so frustrated that this wasn't or still isn't the call to arms that we finally needed to wake up and go, right, enough is enough now. We really need to change fundamentally how we approach how we treat the planet, what we take from it, how we prioritize economic growth over the health of our own children and grandchildren. I thought when I first embarked, hang on a second, where are the obstacles here? Am I being naive? Is, I'm not a politician, I'm not an economist. And I, the more I delved, the more I was like, okay, it's all there. This is it now. We have no time left. Let's get on with it. David Attenborough said something that, that's always stayed with me, and I'm sure you know this quote. Um, anyone who thinks that we can have infinite growth in a, in a, on a planet that has a finite set of resources, number of re resources, is either crazy or an economist. <laughs> I agree with him. Thank you. <laughs>